today we're going to talk about three semiconductor stocks that may need to be on the chopping block. We have Skyworks Solutions, Qualcomm, and Texas Instruments. We're going to start with Texas Instruments. And we believe that the market is only beginning to understand what is going on and the long-term effects their capital expenditure plan is going to have on the company. First, let me share with you some of the numbers from their most recent quarter's earnings reports, and then we'll discuss capital expenditures and free cash flow a little bit more in depth. Revenue for Q2 2023 was $4.5 billion, which was a 13% decrease from last year. Operating profit down 28%, net income down 25% to $1.7 billion, and earnings per share down 24% to $1.87, down from $2.45. Everyone, if you didn't catch our video a few months ago entitled Semiconductor Industry Changing of the Guard, where we talked about Texas Instruments, we talked about ST Microelectronics, the silicon carbide market, and how there's this big shift taking place in power management chips and other analog chips basically the type of chip that deals with real world signals, be that actual management of electricity. It could be a sensor. This is the realm that Texas Instruments primarily plays in. There's that embedded processing segment as well. You can see in the slide here that Casey made, basically microcontrollers where it competes against companies like NXP, Microchip, Infineon, and such. Specifically, these analog chips and power management, we think there is some risk here that Texas Instruments waited too long to invest in some of these next-gen technologies to take advantage of things like electric vehicles, renewable energy, power grid management, things like that. What investors have come to believe is a safe haven buy-and-hold stock, collect the dividends from Texas Instruments, and you're good to go for a really long time. We think that may not necessarily be the story, at least for the next few years. Let's start by looking at this total return chart. Since around 2004, when now former CEO Rich Templeton took over, you can see for nearly the first decade, it was a wash. And only since around 2013, 2014 has Texas Instruments started to see that return on investment. This is a really important point, Casey, because a lot of investors have come to think Texas Instruments, fantastic long-term investment. And it's not that simple. As you mentioned, that first decade when Rich Templeton took over, total return, basically adding dividends back in and reinvesting them into the stock, you didn't make any money. So that 750% return since then is really all since 2013. And so this next chart, I think this is where we want to dig in a little bit more. What's the reason? Why was Texas Instruments dead money for a decade and then suddenly becomes a really fantastic investment for the last decade? A wonderful market-beating stock to own. The second chart. This really has to do with TI's most favorite metric, a metric that we think has gotten famous, I think, especially during the bear market of the last couple of years when a lot of companies got exposed for not being all that profitable, but free cash flow per share. So what this metric is, free cash flow, which is simply put net cash from operating activities minus capital expenditures or CapEx. And CapEx is spending on property, plant, and equipment. This is an important metric for an asset, especially for an asset-heavy business like TI. Because it owns and operates its own fabs, it needs to fill those fabs with equipment like those from the Fab Five. And so whenever you're talking about manufacturing, especially semiconductor manufacturing, it's expensive. Free cash flow is really important because it's money that's left over for shareholders 
after operations are paid for, and then after CapEx is paid for. And then if you really want the best measure of a company's long-term success of returning value to shareholders, you divide it by total share count outstanding. So free cash flow per share. Now we show you this chart here because this is one of our absolute favorite metrics as well, free cash flow per share. We want to show the roughly inverse relationship free cash flow per share has with capital expenditures, CapEx. And this helps explain why TI's stock price didn't do so hot. That period here, you can see a lot of bumpiness in capital expenditures. This was a period of retooling for Texas Instruments. You can see those big peaks in CapEx spending that really kept a lid on free cash flow per share growth that first decade. And then all of a sudden, starting in roughly 2013, Texas Instruments goes on what we'll call an extended capital expenditure holiday. Very little in CapEx spent. The reason for that is a completely different discussion. In a nutshell, though, TI did a great job of utilizing the fabs it already owned and expanding manufacturing capacity there, and then also picking up existing fabs out there for sale on the market and retrofitting them for what they needed them for. Basically, they were able to pick up a lot of assets on the cheap in this decade because there was a lot of underinvestment going on in hard assets in the last decade, and TI included, didn't have to spend a lot in CapEx, and it's because the company repurchases stock, free cash flow per share. That's where you get that fantastic rise in Texas Instruments free cash flow per share, and thus the big run-up in share price over the last decade. So now the plan is to be spending around $5 billion per year in capital expenditures. We know that Texas Instruments is relying on the U.S. CHIPS Act. However, there's only $50 billion worth to share amongst many semiconductor companies. So we know that that will not be bailing Texas Instruments out completely. How is that all going to affect Texas Instruments and this free cash flow per share? You can definitely see it in the chart, Casey. And important to mention too, U.S. CHIPS Act worth $52 billion, but actually $13 billion of that is for research and development. It's really actually only $39 billion-ish dollars earmarked for chip manufacturing. So Texas Instruments is highly profitable, and that's where the cash is coming from. They've also taken out a bit more debt in the last year or so, and you can see the free cash flow per share plummeting here in the last year. And this chart is really amazing because over the last trailing 12-month period, we're not even up to the average of $5 billion capex that the company said to expect for the next few years. So this line is actually going to go higher and on average remain higher than it is right now through probably 2025, 2026. Essentially, what Texas Instruments has been quietly telling the market, but not a lot of investors realize is all of that free cash flow per share growth that you've come to enjoy over the last decade is going away. It's going on hiatus. So we have the CapEx holiday for a decade, and now for the next three or four years, we're going on a free cash flow per share growth hiatus. This is a, a really big risk that I don't think the market has fully priced into Texas Instrument stock yet. And just for reference, I'll share a couple slides from Texas Instruments. Construction is currently underway in Sherman, Texas. Their plan is for that fab to support at least a decade, up to 15 years of growth for the company. Here's another slide as well that helps illustrate what they're thinking. They want to spend all this money now up front to support that 10 to 15 year long-term growth. However, the risk is this return on investment doesn't work out. As Nick mentioned earlier, Texas Instruments does have competitors that are investing in secular growth trends that up until this point, Texas Instruments has not been paying attention to. So we'll draw a couple of trend lines here on this chart, Casey, to illustrate what you're talking about with return on investment. The risk 
I think is not that Texas Instruments won't return to growth, but what if when it does return to growth, because remember 17% year over year decline in sales and Q2, that's in stark contrast to a lot of its peers like on semi ST micro. We had a pretty solid report from NXP semiconductors as well. A myriad of competitors that are at the very least holding steady this year, if not continuing to grow. So Texas Instruments already underperforming on sales, but let's just assume the company will return to growth. But let's draw a long-term trend line on free cash flow per share. Maybe by 2024, 2025, 2026, free cash flow per share rockets higher again. In the last quarter, remember, free cash flow was actually negative for TI in Q2 2023, and it could remain that way off and on for a couple of years. Let's say after this extended period of CapEx boom, free cash flow per share shoots back up. But what if it doesn't return to the long-term trend line? What if, because Texas Instruments misses some of the secular growth trends from things like, let's say, silicon carbide for electric vehicles and the energy grid, some of the work that monolithic power has been doing in shrinking down its power modules, different markets like that. What if they miss that boat and this return on investment from all of this capital expenditure just isn't that good? And so when free cash flow per share does pop again, it doesn't return back to this long-term trend. What if it ends up coming out lower and that's the new reality for TI going forward? A still growing, but a bit less profitable TI than it was over the last decade when they basically had to spend very little money. Nick, if you're a Texas Instruments shareholder, is this stock a hold or sell? We are not Texas Instruments shareholders, and we have no plan to become so. Check out our last video on the power chip market. We'll explain what we are investing in. But if we were Texas Instruments shareholders, I would rank this a hold, if not maybe a trim. Because I don't know how high of a probability, but a higher probability than in the past that Texas Instruments actually swings to market underperform status, possibly most definitely semiconductor market underperform, but maybe even overall market underperform until the company begins easing back on those CapEx plans for the next few years and then starts to show what the results of that are. But that's just going to take time, and it could be a very long time before some real tangible results can be measured. So that's the risk. We think it's a real risk, and the market is not realizing that yet. Let's move on to our second stock, Qualcomm. This company has been one of our favorites for some time now. It was one of our top picks for 2023, and up until this point, the first two quarters have been pretty ugly. But ultimately, most of what has been reported has been expected. Let's discuss whether or not it's time to sell Qualcomm and move on. I'll run through the numbers for Q3 fiscal 2023. So that was the three months that ended in June. Revenue was down 23% year over year to $8.45 billion. Earnings per share $1.60 down 51% from last year. On an adjusted basis, earnings per share was $1.87, which was the high end of guidance for that. And it was down 37% year over year. Free cash flow through the first nine months of the fiscal year 2023 was $6.05 billion, just up slightly from the same time in 2022 free cash flow profit margin, 22%. So this is, of course, all about the smartphone industry. Uh, Casey, you mentioned these last couple of quarters were largely as expected, and that's true. We are really confused as to why the market decided to have this false start with the Qualcomm stock rally, which got unwound after this earnings report. I think maybe the market was getting excited about AI, and Qualcomm is working on AI chips specifically for inference on device, on smartphones, on PCs. We'll get to that momentarily. But 
that's a longer term thing. This is all about the smartphone market right now. It's ugly. Some people declaring smartphones are the new PC market. Basically, it's not growing anymore. Everyone in the world has a smartphone. But that's actually not a new story. That's been the case for several years now. We got the 5G wireless network upgrade boom early in the pandemic. Maybe that comes back a bit as more markets around the world roll out their 5G networks. That remains to be seen. So this really should come as no surprise. I think what is changing, though, is Qualcomm says that a more meaningful uptick in smartphone sales and the inventory adjustment that needs to happen that we've been talking about for a couple quarters now is getting delayed. A lot of this has to do with the Chinese economy not rebounding as quickly as once expected after the COVID restrictions were lifted. And then, of course, in the U.S., in Europe, inflation really starting to bite into consumer wallets and people are just making do with the smartphones that they've had for the last few years since they went shopping for one in 2020, 2021, when we were all stuck at home. So that's the story. Nothing out of the ordinary here, but what has changed is it looks like Qualcomm is delaying its expected rebound until the last few months of this year, or maybe even sometime during the first quarter of calendar year 2024. Qualcomm remains a very highly profitable company. Besides paying a healthy dividend and repurchasing stock, this company continues to diversify heavily into automotive and IoT, Internet of Things. You can see that in Qualcomm's revenue streams. Handsets, of course, down 25% year over year. Internet of Things down 24% year over year, but automotive up 13% year over year. Yes, the automotive in particular is an area to watch. The company just made another acquisition of a startup. Qualcomm bought this company called Vionier. They outbid an auto supplier called Magna to acquire Vionier, but all Qualcomm really wanted was Vionier's automotive software segment that they could package together with chips and use for advanced driver assist and eventually autonomous vehicles that they sell to automakers. They didn't want the active safety division. It's a division that designs and makes systems like seat belts, airbags, and such. After they outbid Magna for it, they actually struck a deal where they were going to sell the active safety division back to Magna anyways. And so Qualcomm just got one and a half billion in cash proceeds from that. So this automotive segment still growing by a very healthy pace. But let's talk maybe briefly here, Casey, about IoT, because this is a catch-all for everything that's not a smartphone or a car, including PCs. So you, you probably know Qualcomm already makes chips for Samsung devices, including their tablets, but they also have PCs. There are some laptops out there that make use of Qualcomm Snapdragon chips. Up to this point, they haven't been very good, but there's new PCs coming out starting next year where they've been working with Microsoft on some higher end devices that will be powered by Snapdragon chips. We'll see how that pans out. That's really exciting, but this involves some of the announcements that Qualcomm has been making with Microsoft and with Meta about doing generative AI inference on device, including on some of these high-end PCs. So we'll see how this partnership with Microsoft pays off. Maybe we actually have a really good ARM-based processor alternative to what Apple has presented the market with the MacBook powered by the M1 and now M2 chips. Qualcomm chips used to power Meta's VR Quest headsets. That's probably also a reason why this IoT segment is down. The Quest 2 was starting to show its age. Sales fell. Quest 3 comes out this autumn. So maybe we start to get an uptick in IoT between those two areas. First, MetaQuest 3, and then maybe next year, some of these new laptops and PCs. But for now, the real growth segment to watch is automotive, which is still going pretty strong. Unlike Texas Instruments, we are a shareholder of Qualcomm stock. What are we doing with our Qualcomm stock, Nick? Is it time to throw in the towel? We don't think so, at least for us 
personally, we're being patient. We think this stock is very cheap. It has a lot of potential if the smartphone market rebounds, but a lot of irons in the fire at Qualcomm with automotive, with IoT, things like PC and VR headsets. Another little interesting announcement, they co-announced along with Bosch, Infineon, Nordic Semiconductor, and NXP Semiconductor that these companies, along with Qualcomm, are all investing in open source RISC V chips, R I S C V. The RISC in that standing for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. Of course, this is a similar technology that ARM uses for its chips that Apple has tapped into with its very powerful and power efficient laptops. So that's probably a much longer term thing to pay attention to this little new chip development segment that Qualcomm is getting started with some of its peers. But nevertheless, I think the point is that we're trying to make for us, Casey, is Qualcomm is highly profitable. And so we're happy to be patient with this one, but it could take some time. Skywork Solutions, another company that we are shareholders of, and we're going to discuss whether or not this company is going to stay in our portfolio as well. Net revenue for Q2 2023 was $1.07 billion, which is a 13% decrease from $1.2 billion last year in 2022. And I'll briefly mention the guidance. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but Q3 guidance is sitting at around $1.215 billion at the midpoint, which would be a 14% decrease from Q3 2022. And Casey, worth mentioning here, Skyworks has a very confusing fiscal year. They just actually wrapped up their 2023 fiscal year. So this is on a calendar year basis. Thank you for cleaning that up in the chart. I'll mention here first, for anyone who's not aware, Skyworks Solutions is another integrated device manufacturer. They design and manufacture wireless chips for predominantly smartphones, but really any mobile device. If you have some sort of device that connects to a network, be it Wi-Fi or to your wireless carrier like Verizon or AT&T or whoever, there's a good chance that there's a Skywork Solutions chip in it. They compete with companies like Qualcomm in this part of the market. These are analog chips, not processors. So Qualcomm has some analog wireless chips. They compete with Broadcom. They compete with Corvo, ticker symbol QRVO. So there's a nice little chart you found, Casey, on some of the products for mobile devices that Skyworks designs and supplies. But there's a big problem with this company. We bought Skyworks Solutions years ago, thinking that this risk would get mitigated over time. And that hasn't panned out. Casey, you did some detective work here and put together a chart that I think really appropriately sums up the risk with Skywork Solutions. Okay, I'm going to start with giving a big hint here, and it goes back to Apple's earnings. Apple said that their iPhone sales for the last quarter were down 2% year over year. Now, what does this have to do with Skywork Solutions? Look at this chart. Out of the $1.07 billion in revenue last quarter, the iPhone alone made up $582 million worth of revenue for this company. And then $103 million comes from other Apple products. So 64% of Skyworks total revenue is from Apple, and 85% of that is iPhones, the rest being other Apple products like the iPad, Mac, and watch. The other two segments of Skyworks revenue are Android and, as Nick mentioned, everything else, all your wearables, smart home devices, Wi-Fi chips. That's $335 million in revenue. And then a small portion automotive at around $50 million. They don't give exact numbers for all of these. It takes a little digging into the earnings call, but these are the numbers we came up with for the revenue breakdown. This is a big issue that so much of their revenue is tied up to Apple, but also one product that Apple sells. 
Yeah, so the indication from Apple that iPhone sales are going to tick up in, in the current quarter, in the fall. But of course, that happens. It happens every year because there's a new iPhone that comes out in the fall. And so spending on that new iPhone goes up and then reaches usually a peak in the fourth quarter during holiday shopping season. So this is more just a seasonal effect. It's not an actual rebound or return to robust year-over-year -year growth for iPhone sales. And so that's a big drag on Skyworks solutions overall. Taking a look again at that segment in automotive, around $50 million in each quarter for revenue breakdown. This was exciting two years ago when Skyworks purchased designs from Silicon Labs for automotive chips. Nick, why could that potentially be a game changer for Skyworks? This is a brand new segment, not just because it's automotive, but it's actually non-wireless connectivity. A lot of this is power management. So Skyworks going headlong into this power management chip game, along with a lot of other companies that we've been talking about, Texas Instruments, earlier in this video, on semi, so on and so forth. We thought that was a game changer, even though it was a high price tag. They actually purchased the automotive and infrastructure business from Silicon Labs for over $2 billion. So they really blew up their balance sheet. Skyworks went from net cash positive balance sheet to now net debt positive balance sheet. So that's not great. In the fourth quarter of 2022, we were listening into a technology conference where one of the executives at Skyworks Solutions had dropped this hint that they were at about a $200 million revenue run rate for automotive. So 50 million a quarter. This quarterly update we just had, the CEO Liam Griffin said that automotive is now well over $200 million a year run rate. So it's probably more than $50 million per quarter at this point. We don't know how much above $50 million. So that's the approximate 50 million that you put on the chart, Casey. But from what it sounds like from nine months ago until now, it sounds like automotive is growing, but not as fast as I had hoped. Maybe this just has to do with economic slowdown. Maybe Skyworks Solutions is capped in what it can produce in its, in its fabs right at the moment for these particular non-connectivity chips. We're just going to have to wait and see. But it is a promising segment, one that we were excited about a couple of years ago, but maybe less enthused about it now here two years later. Okay. So while that does sound promising, are we willing to wait for this to take off? Are we done with Skyworks Solutions? Casey, I think we might be nearing the end of our run with Skyworks Solutions. Maybe not quite just yet, but I really had high hopes for the company years ago, diversifying away from Apple. They've begun to, but they've also continued to pick up more content share of Apple along the way too. They're still highly reliant on Apple, which is if you've been following the semiconductor industry for a long time, Apple can be a wonderful partner, but it cuts both ways. They can also be a terrible partner because Apple is constantly squeezing its suppliers to maintain its own profit margins. And some companies like Qualcomm, and even for a while there, it sounded like even Broadcom, Apple was trying to completely cut out of the mix and design its own chips. For now, it looks like Apple's discovered some of those connectivity chips are not so easy to replace with its own designs. That's beside the point here. Skyworks Solutions, highly reliant on Apple, unlike any other chip company out there. It's a big risk. And some of these other outside markets have really not grown as quickly as we would have liked to see. So stay tuned. But I think we may be moving on to Skyworks sooner rather than later for what we think could be better opportunities for the long term. We do own Apple stock. And I think you've convinced me that of the two, I would much rather have Apple than Skyworks Solutions. To be fair, Skyworks is the cheaper stock. But... As you all know, sometimes cheap price tags are cheap for a reason. So there you go. Basically, I guess I think what we're concluding here, Casey, is at the moment anyways, we have a hold on both of these companies. Thanks everyone for watching today. Stay tuned for more great videos. We have DigitalOcean coming up 
as well as many others. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Don't miss a video. And we will see you all here again soon at Chip Stock Investor.